Hey guys, it's Adam Adams, one of the hosts of the Creative Real Estate Podcast and the Creative Real Estate Lunch Club. And today, what we're sharing in this video is these four experts who have been doing deals without having to use any of their own money or their own credit to buy large apartment complexes. And if you want to learn how to do that, this is an hour of pure question and answer where these four take us through all of the ins and outs of being able to close on these and not only just to close on them, to be able to run them appropriately. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. With that said, we have four panelists. And, uh, oh, okay. We've got four panelists today. And I want to just tell you why did we pick these four people? Because uh, John Reckham's an amazing syndicator as well. There's a lot of other people out there that, that can do syndications, but the reason I picked these four, uh, <coughs> number one, most apartment investors have that mindset of being able to get something done. Like if they think that they want to do something, they'll do it. Uh, so that's the same with all four of these guys. Is my mic even working? Just yeah, you're fine. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, so I want to just show what's different about these four people, uh, the unique thing that I think stands out to them and why I picked them specifically. Uh, Joe Perilous, the reason that I picked you is because I can see that you're the type of person that creates things, uh, reverse engineers everything that you do. So um, with that said, it's things like starting a daily podcast. It seems like understanding that if you grow that network, you'll be able to get to 3,000 doors very, very quickly. Um, everything that you do, I see that you see the future ahead of time, and you always plan to get there. Uh, you figure out all of the steps that you need to do. Uh, Anthony, the reason that I picked you um, is just because how genuine you are. I'm going to cry. With your education. <laughs> How genuine you are with your education. Like, I have only seen you give and give and give and help people regardless if they paid you or not. You've only been that giving person and that genuine love, kindness, care, and compassion to make these people, everybody that you touch, be able to invest in apartment buildings more safely is something that I really respect. Uh, Sarah. You're incredible. Uh, another engineer. There's a lot of apartment investing engineers, uh, which is interesting. Sarah, you've got the brain power uh, to be versatile in everything that you do. I found that no matter what challenge you have, you always have, you're like the jack of all trades, right? You ha always have a little bit of, I, I can do this, I can do that, and you've always been able to get it done. I've appreciated that when working with you in Denver Apartment Network, and uh, I think that, that brings a lot to the table here. Mike Crana. You're so smart, and you you're, you have hundreds of deals, but you're the most humble guy I've ever met in my whole life. I really appreciate you being willing to be up there. Guys, I had to twist Mike's arm to be on the panel. He wasn't sure what he could offer, and this guy's one of the best guys at doing due diligence on an apartment building and underwriting a deal that you'll ever meet in your life. So that's why I have Mike Crana. So give it a round of applause for these guys making their way to be We've got, we've got 24 questions that we're going to ask, then we'll turn it over to the audience. How it's going to go when it goes to the audience is if you think you have a question for these guys, you go up to Scott and, uh, and we'll let as many people in as possible. So let's get over these 24 questions. I'll start and then Scott will be in the next one. Mic check. Test, test. Perfect. Yours works even better than mine. So. All right. So where do you live and where do you invest? Mike. Let's do a mic test. Is that mic? Working okay? Yeah. Mic to mic? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the easiest question on the list. Uh, I live in Loveland, Colorado, and I invest in primarily tertiary markets across the United States. That's that's where I focus. Live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and invest primarily in Texas. Our entire portfolio is in Texas right now, but we look in other markets. I live in Denver, the Denver metro area, but we invest all across the country. We've got properties anywhere from Arizona through the south all the way to Florida, and then we have a couple properties in Kansas, Iowa, and Ohio. All right, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm here locally in the Denver metro area, and all of my active investing is here in the Denver market. Um, as far as passive investments, I have investments in uh, North Carolina, Dallas, uh, Dallas, Texas, and Oklahoma, as well as Hawaii. Awesome. All right. 
Well, uh, next question for you all. Um, what do you do besides apartment investing? Do you have other gigs, or is this your full-time um, full occupation? Uh, this is my full-time occupation. This is it for me. Uh, I do have some legacy investments, uh, single-family homes, condos, uh, mobile home park, that I'm gradually uh, moving out of my portfolio because apartments is where it is at for me. <laughs> full full time apartment investor. All roads lead back to apartment investing for me. I do have a daily podcast. I've, I've interviewed over thirteen hundred people. So the last thirteen hundred days, I've had a podcast release. But that ties into apartment investing. Um, so that's full time. Thing. Most of what I do is apartments. Whether it's educating people how to buy apartments, buying apartments myself or with my students. Uh, I also raise a lot of money for different deals. I think that's why we're here for the syndication. So that's pretty much my main focus is apartments. I do have some single family homes and condos because there's other reasons to have those. You have to go visit them when it gets cold here in Colorado. As a matter of fact, we have property in Belize as well. We're going down there tomorrow to check it out. It's an investment. We have to, it's a business trip. Um, so this is full time for me now. Uh, I'm actually going to People, I started out with a full-time job in engineering and um, started buying two to four unit multifamily properties and eventually moved into syndication about two years ago. Um, and the great thing about syndication and real estate is I'm full-time, but I still have lots of free time too. Awesome. I have a question for you guys. How did you get into apartment investing? How did you start getting into apartments in the first place? Well, I, I love real estate and I love business. Uh, and I'm an engineer by trade, training. So it just falls naturally to me to go after investments and business dealings that have a, a very strong business profit and loss. Work the numbers. This is how the value and the income is determined. That's what appeals to me. And that's what attracted me in the first place. I got into apartment investing because I had some single family homes that I purchased while having my full time job at an advertising agency in New York City. And then I realized that I was making about 250 bucks a month from those homes and then someone would move out and then I'd lose $5,000 to get it moving ready. So it was going to take like 457 years for me to actually become financially independent <laughs> through that process. So then I, that's, that happens with that realization happens simultaneously with me. Being more well, being apathetic towards my full time job, I wanted to grow and contribute and be mentally stimulated a little bit more. So, with me leaving my full time job and also having realization that single family homes weren't going to cut it, I then decided to get into apartment investing. So, just for the record, um, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Okay? Uh, let's see, how did I get into apartments? I, I started like a lot of people did, doing single family homes. My wife and I, for 10 years, did buy and hold, because that's all we knew. And then we took some classes, learned that you could do wholesale and fixing and flipping and that kind of stuff. And we did that. But then we also learned very, very quickly that that was a job. Because literally, you go along, you do a deal, you make some money, go along, you do a deal, you make some money, and you're always going back to zero. And what I learned is when you're not doing deals, what are you doing? Here, here let me help you out. Ready? It was a job. So I found a partner. We started buying apartment buildings back in 2004. Our first one was 14 units in, outside of Oklahoma City. And we had to look back from, from that point because the checks were bigger. The cash kept coming in. It, you certainly have people that move in and move out. But... You've got all the other people still in all the other units who are helping to pay the expenses, pay the mortgage, and that kind of stuff. So I fell in love with it and been doing that pretty much ever since. So I got into apartment investing after investing um, in smaller units for about 10 years. And uh, the main issue that we had with the smaller properties is uh, management. Even though we eventually moved over to property managers, um, still just a lot of moving parts, uh, you know, doing taxes for each property individually. And with apartments, you get the economies of scale that you don't get with those smaller properties. You can have one manager uh, managing 100 units, for instance, on our most recent property. And, um, you know, you have to get one loan. You have uh, one insurance policy. Just the economies of scale really appealed to me. Um, I got connected. Um, I guess the first thing that really 
got me interested in thinking that it was possible was the book The ABCs of Real Estate Investing by Ken McElroy. I highly recommend it um, for anyone who's interested in learning the nuts and bolts of apartment, apartment investing. And um, in addition to that, you know, coming to Anthony Tars Lunch Club and meetups like this around Denver. And then my primary um, investment group is Brad Sunrock's organization out of Dallas. And um, joining that network just gave me a huge kick, uh, jump start, getting into the business, um, meeting investors, and learning how to analyze these uh, much larger deals. What made you decide to start syndicating in multifamily real estate? Well, really, to, to kind of go off Sarah's comment about um, about economies of scale. Uh, I realized early on I couldn't get there by myself and that I really needed to leverage both my time, my money, and provide opportunities to other people to invest in real estate, which is the thing that I love. So that's what drove me towards syndicating. And, and I see syndication as anything where it's more than just a couple of buddies getting together, uh, that it's a little more structured. You're, you know, you're putting together a deal. Uh, and, and I realized that that was how I could get where I wanted to go. Necessity. Whenever I, I, I left my full-time job, I did not have a W-2 income. And since I didn't have a W-2 income, I wasn't going to be very uh, desirable to a lender, even though that's one component of the approval process for commercial. Uh, I also didn't have the experience. I had four single-family homes, but I didn't have the experience that was needed to actually buy an apartment building. Uh, so I decided that it would make more sense to partner with others who had that experience, had the balance sheet. I brought some value to the deal, and we could do it together. So I started syndicating because I knew my pockets were only so deep. And if I wanted to get to where I wanted to go, I knew I couldn't just rely on myself and do it all by myself. So I started bringing in other people to partner with me. Ditto. <laughs> all right, this, this question can be a pretty short answer. Uh, what I'm trying to find out is uh, what is that one piece of advice that you would uh, share with, with us that would change our worlds to be able to get into, into syndication? That one piece of advice. I have four. I have four answers to that question. <laughs> uh, really, the one, the one piece of advice would be get a good firm grasp of the fundamentals. It all goes back to the fundamentals. You feel comfortable with investing in analyzing deals. I agree. Once we have a firm grasp of the fundamentals, I would say then the building a network. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki, whenever I interviewed him on my podcast, he said the richest people in the world build a network, everyone else looks for work. And that is so true. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Um, I mean, that's what, what people do who do larger deals and scale their businesses, build a network. Uh, for me, a couple pieces of advice would be, well, I'll give you two. So first off would be get educated, number one. Don't just jump into this blindly unless you're doing a smaller deal because chances are you don't ever plan on seeing that money again. Number two would be don't be afraid to partner with other people. And I know that could be scary, but what I would recommend is if you have limited experience, maybe join with someone else in here that has the experience that's done those types of deals. Join on one of their investments and start learning that way. And I'll echo what everyone else is saying. Um, I'd say the top two are find a mentor and find a network. Uh, when I first read that book and mentioned the ABC's real estate investing, I didn't know a single person who had ever syndicated an apartment building. And now I have over 500 investors um, and friends who are in this business with me. So find a, find, a, find a network, find a mentor. Awesome. So looking forward into 2018, what do you think some of the most interesting trends might be in multifamily real estate? Um, I think I'm going to answer the opposite of that question. <laughs> it's not my question. I <laughs> know. <laughs> I got to this point because I go certain ways, whatever, I'm supposed to go other ways. Uh, my thought process is I don't focus on trends. What I focus on are fundamentals. And when we get caught up in what's going to happen to um, the market and when is it, when are we going to have a downturn, when is certain things going to happen, I think we're trying to uh, look into a crystal ball that doesn't exist. So instead... My focus is on buying fundamentally sound 
taking a fundamentally sound way of, of purchasing properties. And that's uh, brought to life in three ways. And when we do it these three ways, then regardless of what type of trends happen in the marketplace for multifamily or, or just macro level, we're going to be on firm ground. One is buy for cash flow, not for appreciation. Two is have long-term debt on properties. And three is have ad- adequate cash reserves for a rainy day scenario while doing the sensitivity analysis on our properties. When we do those three things, then regardless of macro level trends, most likely we're going to be fine. Now, certainly there might be some disruptors where maybe it makes house home ownership a lot easier to attain. Maybe there's some technology that comes out. I don't know. But I know when we do those three fundamentals, certainly we have to take a look at certain trends from um, a, a financing, debt financing standpoint. Um, but fundamentally sound real estate, that's the way we do it. There are a lot of trends going on. The one I would point to uh, just for this year would be that I see a lot of capital moving into smaller markets. Chasing yield. Everybody wants to get 8%, 10% cap deals. Uh, try to find a, a 10% cap deal in Denver. Uh, there's a lot of money moving from this kind of market to smaller deals, to smaller markets. And that's where hopefully we're ahead of that and buying into those those smaller markets that are that are emerging and, uh, and getting so much attention from the big money. So I would agree with what they're basically saying. The fundamentals are very important, and you can always buy a good deal in any market, but you do need to be you do need to take what's going on in the market into account. And there's a couple of markets around the country, Denver being one of them, that have now gone into hyper supply, which means the market may be really good right now, really hot, and you're still hearing a lot of really good stuff, but eventually it's going to go into recession. And what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of uh, extra units on the market. You're going to have a lot of apartment buildings that are starting to discount their rent, and you're going to have to be able to compete with that. So if you don't do what Joe said and actually worry about the, get the right fundamentals, you can find yourself upside down very, very quickly. So... You do need to look at some of the market fundamentals as well, not just the building fundamentals, to make sure you're getting in at the right market at the right time, or get just a smoke and deal so you don't have to worry about if somebody else drops their rent $100 a month or $200 a month. Because right now, the average rent in Denver is what, 18, 19, 2000? And it's ridiculous. Matter of fact, I was just down in Los Angeles. There's an area of West Los Angeles, the average rent is $2,900 a month. That's nuts. Um, I'll just uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. I'd say one of the trends that we've been seeing the last few years, and I think we'll continue to see this upcoming year, is the demand for work workforce housing. And you know, that's the those are the apartment communities that people, you know, they're holding out a full time job, but they maybe couldn't qualify for a home on their own. Um, also known as B and C class properties, usually properties built before the eighties, um, are what we consider workforce housing, and the demand for these properties are huge, both by investors and by <laughs> residents. Uh, for one, those residents want an affordable place to live, and on the investor side, a lot of those older properties give you the opportunity to add value. They maybe haven't been renovated in 40 years. Um, there might be a mom pop owner who haven't um, you know, started building back utilities, for instance, and things that you can add value to the property right away. So I think that's one trend that we're going to continue to see is um, high demand for BNC class properties, rent growth, and um, potentially continued compressed tax rates in the Denver market. Do you guys see a challenge in today's market? Do you guys see a challenge in today's market, and uh, and what is that challenge? Um, for me personally, um, I know a lot of these guys are looking nationwide at multifamily par- uh, properties. I've been limiting my search to Denver, Colorado Springs, and Fort Collins. And around here, getting a deal is a, uh, a tall order. Um, there's a lot of competition, like Anthony was saying, with money coming in from overseas. Um, so you have to know your numbers really well and get your underwriting extremely tight in order to get a deal in this market. I think the big thing is not just the competition, but again, the market is changing. The apartment markets across the country have been booming since 2009, whether you knew it or not, and it's starting to soften. So there's a lot of major markets. Denver's one of them, Washington, D.C., Atlanta. There's a few others, even Baltimore, that are starting to turn, and you're going to see that tipping point. So what I would do is I would do 
the challenge is you need to find a market that is not at that point yet. It's still starting its expansion phase and it's going to continue to expand. Because even though apartments nationwide are going into hyper supply, all the apartment markets are local. So there's a couple things that make it a national thing. There's the, the amount of liquidity in the market, which is controlled by the government, interest rates and inflation, which are also controlled by the government to a certain extent. But the rest of it is all local. The local market dictates based on the job growth, the in-migration where people are moving in to fill those jobs. is really what grows that particular market. So even if the whole market as a general across the country is softening, you can still find really good markets and pockets around the country where it's a good time to get in. So just double check that. <laughs> uh, uh, challenge is finding deals and the many solutions, but one solution in particular for that might be helpful for uh, everyone in the room is partnering with brokers, uh, asking them a question who, uh, and that question is, would you like to be on this deal if we're awarded it? Now, clearly there's transparency that needs to be involved in some disclosures to the um to the owner who's repre- who they're representing, but that has been a- an effective way that uh, helps move the needle in one direction uh, to help you get deals. Many other ways. I'm I'm speaking about this for a while tomorrow at my conference, but uh, that that's one tactic that can be helpful. Well, I would agree with everyone that finding deals today is the biggest challenge. Deals that make sense and make sense for a long term investment. Um, the thing that that I really focus on right now is, as, as Joe mentioned, work with work with brokers, build those relationships, but also be analyzing deals that they send you and feed back to them why those deals may or may not work for you so that they can fine-tune what you're looking for with what is coming available to them. So for those folks who want to dive deeper, into uh, real estate syndication. Is there a great resource that you could recommend to presumably everyone in the room? Good proof. <laughs> Good plus. Uh, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, I think there's, there, there are really two parts to that question. One is to learn more about in apartment investing. And there's some great resources right in this room uh, to, to build that, that fundamental knowledge. The other is on the syndication side, uh, because then we start talking about the SEC and what syndication means from a legal standpoint. Uh, And I would encourage everybody to read um, the book that Gene Trowbridge wrote. Uh, It's called It's a Whole New Business. Uh, I would say Gene is probably, uh, well, he's the expert I, I point to when it comes to syndication and doing a Reg D, 506A, whatever it is that you're looking at putting together as, a, as part of the syndication. Well, I can't mention Gene anymore. I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed that book. Uh, the only challenge I have with that book is it's written a lot toward brokers uh, who are going into syndication. I'm not a broker. never have been one. Uh, so... Uh, but that is a really good book to, and from 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 a fundamental standpoint, uh, I'd say the some other resources, listening to uh, podcasts, um, as well as uh, you know how, how I learn is through interviewing people and then soaking up knowledge. So if you uh, instead of being passively learning, instead of instead you're actively engaged. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, create a network. One way you can create a network and learn along the way is simply have some sort of interview-based platform, whether it's as simple as a blog or a YouTube channel or a podcast, or maybe it's a meetup like this. And you interview people, and then while you're interviewing them, you're learning along the way. That's It's, an, it's a, a very good way to engage yourself in the conversation versus passively reading about it. Um, that and if you go to multifamilysyndication.com, I've got a bunch of YouTube videos, all specifically related to syndication. I would recommend you take some classes. I know Gene Trowbridge does have a class. Also, my SEC attorney who works with Gene, their partners together, Julian Sidoti, does a one-day class. Matter of fact, she'll come out here once or twice a year and she'll do a one-day workshop. So that's another way to learn. Is it just starts out with getting educated and just like these guys have said, start just asking questions.
Find out from people who've been there, done that. Don't don't talk to somebody who read a book. Go find out people who have actually done it. They've done their own syndications. They've raised money and that kind of stuff. They're the ones that have been there because there's some things that you're not going to learn from people who say, yeah, I went to somebody's seminar. Well, that's great. But the reality comes when you actually start putting it into action, and that's when you get the real education. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, educate yourself first, podcast books. Um, and then once you feel like you know everything, before you go and jump into a deal, I would recommend uh, talking to your core four partners. Um, in my opinion, those would be your brokers. Um, meet, meet brokers, talk to brokers. You can find them even on LoopNet, uh, larger unit properties. You can find them through a Google search of the top commercial brokers for multifamily and you know, the Denver market or whatever market you're interested in. Um, start building those relationships early. Um, also start building your lender relationships. Um, commercial financing is a whole new ball game. There'll be a lot to learn. Um, so try to meet, find a lender that you enjoy working with, who can educate you on the different loan products. Um, and then also your property management team is going to be key. Um, I personally do not enjoy personally managing my own properties and, you know, collecting rent and, uh, dealing with repairs. So you want a top-notch property manager on your team. So start talking with them early. Um, by talking to a number of property managers, you'll learn what questions to ask um, and who would be the best fit for your deal down the road. And then thirdly, your network of investors and potential partners um, who you can meet at events like this. Um, ask people what they do, um, if they want to partner with you, what they're looking for. Um, it's just a huge um, network of resources that way for partners and investors. So that would be my advice. Thank you, guys. Uh, next question. And if it doesn't apply to you, that's okay. Just pass the mic. But what's the biggest risk you've ever taken and how did it play out? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest risk that we took, we syndicated a casino in Cripple Creek. Yes, it was a gamble. <laughs> and you know what can happen sometimes when you gamble? You can win big. Or you can lose big. We lost big, crashed and burned, $1.5 million of syndicated funds out the door in six months. So that was our biggest risk. That was our, not the biggest amount that we raised, but just the biggest risk that we took, and it, that particular one didn't work out. Anyone else? I'll make one comment. Um, so, you know, I'm new. I'm, I've been doing syndication for about two years. Um, and our first big deal, uh, 100 units in Aurora, and we had to put down $50,000 of hard money on day one of the contract signing. So for people who are just starting out, I just wanted to mention that's something you'll probably have to do if you go after a larger deal. And it's very uncomfortable. What hard money means in this sense, it's not a hard money lender, but what hard money means is you're giving that money to the seller no matter what. Even if you find foundation issues, pest control, you know, bed bugs, roof, roof needs replacing, whatever it is, doesn't matter. That money is now the seller's and you'll never get it back. And when you do it on day one of the contract signing, you haven't done any of your due diligence, um, which usually is, you know, 21 days or so in the contract period. Um, so one way we reduced our risk a little bit was having a pre-inspection period where we could have an HVAC person, a plumber, a roofer. Um, general contractor go out and inspect the property um, before we officially signed the contract. But that was, you know, that made me very uncomfortable um, on the first deal. And, um, you know, that property is going great now. We didn't uncover any issues in the normal due diligence period. So it all worked well. But, um, you know, just get ready for that when you do these larger deals. I paused initially because I was, when you said what's the biggest risk, I was thinking I haven't been skydiving. So I wouldn't even think of apartments. I was still uh, from an apartment standpoint, one thing that comes to mind is when we were syndicating our first deal you know, with Ashcroft Capital, um, my company, it was oil prices were tanking. No pun intended. Oil prices were going down big time. And approximately a week and a half, two weeks prior to closing, on a 250-unit apartment community for $14.1 million, lender backed out. 
they weren't comfortable with. He, we're in Houston. I don't know if I mentioned that. We're in Houston, Texas. And we were scrambling. Uh, we ended up finding a different lender in a very short period of time um, to close that gap. And fortunately, it's uh, worked out very well. We've since put in $2 million into that property, so sixteen point one total. And 15 months later, it appraised at $21.6 million. So, joke's on the lender, first and foremost. <laughs> but, but secondly, I think it goes back to the fundamentals. When you are comfortable with how you analyze properties and you have the analysis down, then you move forward. I uh, was talking to these gentlemen in Spartan Capital uh, a little bit before we started uh, this panel, and a lender backed out with their deal like 10 days prior to closing, right? And then they had to go raise the, the difference. So, you know, how resourceful are you and how much do you believe in the process? I had to think really hard about this question because it made me think. It made me think back to all the deals that I've done, and every time I did a deal, it was a huge risk. I was going outside my comfort zone from the very start. And that was when I started with my first single family home to the 100 unit that we closed last year in Georgia. It's just a question of degree, what you're accustomed to, what you're comfortable with, and what you're willing to commit to. And uh, and for me, it was a, I used to skydive years ago. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not risk averse by any means. Uh, but I am also an engineer, so I do calculated risks. And the biggest risk I took was pledging my entire single-family home portfolio to close a deal last year. So, guys, we've heard it a lot. Uh, syndication and multifamily is a team sport. Um, but who do you have on your team, and why? I think I've answered that one, so I'll pass that one along. But um, just property manager, um, lender, um, attorneys, um, investors, partners, uh, everybody has a role to play. And, um, you know, once you form those relationships, the great thing about the syndication business is that you don't have to be in all those areas of your business every day. You can... Um, have these contractors do all these important functions for you to free up your time and resources, which I think is why um, you know everybody gets some real estate in the first place. So the biggest people you need to have on your team, of course, not only just the attorney, but you need to have multiple attorneys. You need to have one that helps you with your syndication. Then you need to have a real estate attorney for your real estate deals. And I would also recommend that your real estate attorney be located in the state where the property is located. If you're buying in Nebraska, it may not do you any good to have an attorney here in Colorado. So make sure you have a real estate attorney in the state where the property is located. Your syndication attorney, you need to have a good property management team, good property management company. Um, brokers, kind of, to me, kind of come and go. It's great if you can have a good broker, but we're buying stuff all over the country. So we don't necessarily have one that I would say is on our team for doing that portion of it. And then, of course, you have to have your asset manager. The asset manager is the person who takes care of the property manager and all of your investors. So that would be another good person to have on your team because without them coordinating everything before and after the close and talking to the CPA and the investors and the property managers and everything falls on you, and then that's a lot of extra time. That I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend time doing that. <laughs> uh, so the, I agree. I mean, those are all team members. I don't know if I can add anything there. So I'll take a different approach, and that is um, from an inward standpoint with your team, with your company that that you're that you're creating to syndicate deals versus maybe the out, outward team. So that company, basically we're doing two things. We're matching up money with deals. We're matching up two things, money and deals. Therefore, you'll want to make sure you have the mo money that you need, and you want to make sure you have the deals that you need. And it's that simple, and then you need an, 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 a team that executes very well, whether it's in-house property management or whether it's third party. So with that information, then it's time to take a look in the mirror and say, what am I good at? What can I compete at a world-class level at? Because ultimately, your business 
will be exponentially more successful if you focus on what you can compete at a world-class level at and do that well. And then see where does that line up? Is that on the money part? Or is that on the finding deals and analyzing part? Or is that on the management part? And then simply find other team members who can complement you and partner up with them, whether it's on the general partnership side or whether you're hiring them as a vendor or a contractor or whatever. Uh, that's how we've scaled our company to the degree that we scaled it because we all focus on what we're especially talented at doing. We keep our head down. We focus on that. And when we do that, then we rise a lot faster than what's difficult. Good comment. Uh, for me, having private lenders or access to private money at the front end of a deal is, is crucial. So having people on my team who are willing to invest up front to take some of the big risk to get a deal rolling, uh, that's a big part of having uh, someone on my, on my team. And I would say, like everybody else, to partner with people who have complementary skills. Uh, I get pretty anal sometimes about analysis, uh, and sometimes I'm looking for a, more of a free-flowing spirit to help carry the deal forward. Awesome. So let's uh, dive into your business. Who do you have on your team? What does your syndication company look like? Uh, I'm a fairly small operator, and I pull in people as I need to. I've got four key partners who have complementary skills. They either are, they're all investors themselves, and they come into my deals as we need to, to put a deal together. Uh, I do have, I did have, uh, I think, the best real estate attorney in the world, uh, but unfortunately he died, so I'm, I'm still looking for someone to replace him. Uh, and, uh, and that really is it. I've got a stellar accountant uh, to keep my my numbers straight and make sure that I'm uh, keeping my keeping that I'm satisfying my promises to my investors. And and with your guys' teams, what is what does a day look like working with your team? Like who does what? I actually broke it down into percentages. <laughs> <laughs> Engineer. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's really pretty simple. 30% uh, of the day is spent with asset or syndication management, just the nuts and bolts of running the business every day. 40% uh, is on active deals that are in some stage where the LOI is under contract, uh, scrambling to close, whatever that might be. 15% uh, in, in inbound marketing and 15% in outbound marketing. Everybody has their calculators to make sure that's a whole day. <laughs> oh, I was guaranteed that's 100%. <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, from a high level, like I mentioned earlier, matching up money and deals. So thinking about it that way, my responsibility is to make sure we have the money for our deals. Uh, and then my my uh, the co-founder of Ashcroft Capital, uh, Frank, he is primarily responsible for finding deals and the underwriting. And he, he's actually an engineer. He's a civil engineer of background, and he, he built his own underwriting template from scratch, and that's the type of mind he has. So he does the primary underwriting for our deals and the asset management. We have a third-party property management company for our deals. Um, other people on the team, we each, Frank and I each have an executive assistant. They do everything from scheduling calls to um, you know, some investor inquiries that are more um, administrative-focused. We also have a team of underwriters in New York City in some basement with no windows right now, just underwriting deals uh, methodically. One of them is on staff. The others are 1099. We just pay them uh, an hourly rate of approximately $15 an hour. And then I have a team that's focused on content that helps me with my half of the business. Um, and that is, you know, I've got a person on social media, I've got a person who helps me with content creation, um, and then we have you know attorneys and, and such like that too. So my daily for the deal structuring part of it, the deal portion of it, is pretty much non-existent. We spend from about sixty to ninety days out once the property is found until it gets funded, 
I'm spending a lot of time raising money, working with the students, we're analyzing the deal. I might actually go out and check out the property physically and walk the property with the student to tell them what I like, what I don't like, what my concerns are with the property, if there are any. But after that, once we close, I'm pretty much hands off. I let my the asset manager take care of all that stuff. And then maybe once a month, we might have a conference call to actually chat about the property. So it seems pretty similar to... Um to Mike, you know, I've been doing this two years. Most of my team members are you know, contractors. I don't have employees per se. I do have three business partners, one being my husband, two being uh, very experienced syndicators. I met with um, out of that Brad Summer Investment Group out of Dallas. And um, for me, a typical day is looking at new deals, talking to brokers, um, talking to any investors interested in owning real estate passively. Um, and you know that it's pretty. That's pretty much it. All the operational things are taken care of by the property manager. Um, I am the asset manager, so I do have weekly calls with our property managers, making sure that they're keeping their eye on the ball, implementing our business plan. Um, we're value add investors, so we find properties that do need a little bit of work. Um, you know, we remodel the interiors, spruce up the landscaping, put on new signage, things like that. So there's always projects going on that I'm uh, overseeing in that sense. But um, yeah, finding deals, finding investors, um, managing existing properties, one of the key things. That's great. Thank you. Um, so it's hard to find a deal. Um, how do you guys find or source your multifamily deals? Uh, I do mine through three things. Uh, brokers, word of mouth through my network. And also related, what I'll call related professionals. Um, I have insurance agents, um, accountants, attorneys, people, professional people who are exposed all the time to potential off-market deals that that I build relationships with, so that when they hear something, they can pass it along to me. Uh, brokers. My podcast, I get a lot of leads, and through the meetup that I do, and um, one tip for everyone in the room is if you are going to take my advice and building a, and you build a network, then interview property owners for your blog or your meetup or whatever. That way you build a relationship with him or her. And over the long run, you're going to have a, a higher probability of closing a deal with that person. Uh, so you can be very strategic. First, you got to know what type of property you're looking for, and then once you know that, then you can be strategic with what type of what owners own or what properties uh, have certain owners, and then invite those owners to speak at your meetup, build a relationship that way. I seriously love how you reverse engineer everything that you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's always got a purpose. So I have uh, brokers around the country that know what I do and what I'm looking for. They'll send us deals occasionally, but I also have thousands of students that have deals. They go out and they find them. They come to the class. They get educated to go out and start looking in their own backyard, and occasionally they'll need some assistance, so they'll come back to me. The other thing that I do, of course, is um, I speak at as many events as I possibly can, whether it's this or a lot of the local real estate groups. And so I have to stand up for this part so you can fully understand it. But literally what will happen is because I do so much speaking, people will inevitably walk up to me. Even if I'm not there to speak, they know who I am because somebody might have said, hey, there's the guy we need to go talk to. And they'll walk up to me and they'll say, hey, you're the apartment guy, right? And I do this. I go, Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a great way to find property. Says I literally have people coming up to me that I have no idea who they are. I don't know if I've ever met them before. Sometimes they have. Sometimes they haven't. I meet tens of thousands of people every single year. And it's just nice to have that ability to have people come up to me. And, and one of the things I tell my students is it's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. And so one of the things you can do is start speaking and doing something, help other people out, you know, talk to Adam and his group about, you know, if you do have some experience with real estate or apartments, maybe they can give you five or 10 minutes at the beginning of the meeting to stand up and talk about something that you worked on or some of the local real estate groups that are all up and down the front range, go to them and tell them this is your experience, show them a little 
PowerPoint presentation and see if they'll give you five or ten minutes. Most of those groups love to have local people get up on stage and talk about their success. Yeah, I don't have too much more to add. I'll just make a note about um, working with brokers because on the you know, single family, small multifamily side, I know a lot of people who are in real estate in those areas will try direct marketing, uh, knocking on doors, calling owners um, directly. And while that still can be successful in multifamily investing, uh, the brokers really have the market cornered. Um, so it's going to be a lot harder for you to call up an owner and say, hey, I want to buy your apartment building. Because usually you're dealing with savvy owners who know what their properties were, know that they're going to get the best price listening on the open market. And so with the larger properties, I would just highlight, you know, you do want to have those broker relationships and pay them well, treat them well, um, which is a little different than you know, smaller properties. How do you guys do your pre-underwriting? Just take us from like the full underwriting process. How do you find out just right away if something's a deal or not? Um, so, so for me, I'd say it's difficult to know right away if it's a deal, um, at least in the Denver market. In some Midwest markets where cap rates are, you know, 8% still, um, you know, you're going to make money no matter what, unless it's just a com completely run down. Um, so with the Denver, Colorado Springs, <coughs> Collins markets, um, the number one question I ask is, you know, what value is there left to add? Because you're going to be buying these properties at a six cap or below. And there has to be enough meat on the bone in the industry lingo to increase the value of that property over time. So um, one example I gave earlier was, are they doing utility build back? That's called a rub system. Um, you know, on these properties, it could be $50,000 a year and up in utility expenses. And if the owners aren't currently billing back the tenants, that's a huge bump to your profit margin if you just implement that simple system. Um, are the units unrenovated and in a, in a neighborhood where people will pay more to have a nicer unit? Um, that's another way you can add value to these properties. Um, are they doing water conservation? Another really simple thing, you can put on $1 aerators on the faucets and shower heads, cut your water bill by 30%, and being in Colorado, that's usually a, one of the largest utility expenses you'll have as an owner. Um, so for me, um, is there enough value add? And if I, you know, there's two or three things I could do, then it's worth digging into a little more. I think in order to do an initial analysis, uh, if the deal makes sense, you got to know what you're looking for. And uh, that's the most important thing. So first, know what you're looking for. And what we look for are Class B properties that built between 1980 and 2005 that have value add components to them that are stabilized and that are in a metropolitan statistical area, MSA, of a million or plus people. Now, we, so when I see a deal that fits, uh, fits that, then it's something that we look further into, and we do a more detailed underwriting analysis. So we're a lot of great ideas uh, from everybody at, we're also looking for value-add properties, but we're not afraid to shy away from ones that are completely vacant. So we've had one, matter of fact, the one we bought a couple years ago was 94 units, completely vacant, bought it for $3,000 a door. So $311,000, 800000 in renovation. When it was done, it was worth $2.5 million. So we're willing to look for that. We're willing to look for stabilized properties, but literally we can tell. I actually have a spreadsheet that I use, and when the numbers come in, I just plug it into the spreadsheet, and I can tell within 10 minutes or less whether or not it's something that I want to spend more time analyzing and moving forward on. And that's a great spreadsheet. I use it all the time. Now, didn't somebody make an announcement about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I don't guess to say. See you guys. The thing that I do is... is and see if a deal meets, first, I don't know if it's a deal, but does a proposal meet my basic criteria? Uh, the important thing about building relationship with brokers is to communicate to them what it is that you're looking for, what kind of deal that you're willing to entertain, uh, that, that fits in your wheelhouse. Uh, I like to specialize on, on certain kinds of things. 
I, I'm not looking for mixed use properties. I'm not looking for uh, industrial properties. I'm looking for C class multifamily in a 50 to 150, even maybe 200 units in certain kinds of markets. So, first, it doesn't meet my checklist, my criteria. And I try to filter that with the relationships that I've got with brokers. And then it is to go through a simple, quick analysis using uh, Anthony's tool, actually, uh, that allows me to take a look at it and see, does it meet my next question, 20% minimum return? Great transition. Uh, elaborating on Adam's question, so what does your full underwriting process look like? We don't have enough time for that. <laughs> uh, the full underwriting process really goes from a quick analysis on a sheet, a single sheet of paper, to a multi-sheet uh, spreadsheet that involves looking at all the all the facets of the deal that are going to affect whether it's going to make money or not. And that can be from, from the, the financing, putting together a financing model for it, a repairs and renovation model, and ultimately, what's, what's the exit strategy? And that's part of that, that whole underwriting process. I'd say the shocking thing that I come across is investors closing on a deal, handing it over to their property management company, and the property management company for the very first time seeing their pro forma. That's the, that, that, to me, is... The, a takeaway, the more important than us, me, going through our underwriting process, because it is, you know, how much time we got. But who's managing your property, and are they on board with the projections that you have? Because ultimately, with our deal, we do value add deals, we need to make sure that we can get the rent premiums that we're projecting, and that we can stay on budget to uh, generate those rent premiums through those renovations. And if our management partner isn't on board, and if they see it for the first time after we close on the property, that's a big old problem. Big old problem. And a lot of investors do that, especially first time. So make sure that we have the property management company validating the assumptions that we are putting in our underwriting along the way so that we can hold them accountable. And by the way, when... We send our underwriting to the management company. We have a more aggressive underwriting that we give to them than we actually share with our investors. That way, if they hit their aggressive underwriting they agree to, then we're going to be great from an investor standpoint. So just to add to what these guys have already said, the only other thing I would add is has to do with you actually, you personally, physically inspecting the property. I'm not a big proponent of inspecting the property if, if it's in my backyard, I'm, I'm no problem going out and taking a look at it. But a lot of the stuff that we're buying is out of the state. It's across the country. I'm not going to get on a plane. I'm not going to go fly to the property to check it out before I'm under contract. I don't know how many times I've heard brokers, they come back and they say, well, the, the seller likes your agreement, but they won't sign it until you come see the property. I've seen thousands of properties. I'm not going to go. I don't need to see the pitch roof, the flat roof, the brick siding, the aluminum siding, the brick siding, whatever it is. But if some of them are really, really pushy, one of the things that you can do is you can find a partner in the area, which could be your buyer's agent, if you have a buyer's agent, or your new property management company, if you've already got them on board, which is a key component you should have very short, uh, very soon into the process, have them go by and take a look at the property for you. Having said that, though, after you go under contract, at some point, you need to actually go look at your own property and make sure you have some good people with you, a good inspector or a general contractor or somebody that can go with you and inspect the major components to know that what the seller is telling you and how they're trying to sell you the deal is actually true and accurate, and they're not trying to blow smoke and tell you, oh, yeah, it's a 10-year-old boiler, and you find out, well, add a zero to the end of the 10, and it's a 100-year-old boiler that's on its last legs. So make sure you go check it out. So um, I'll just mention a few quick tips about um, underwriting a deal in general. So number one, the broker's pro forma is not going to be your pro forma, almost guaranteed. Um, you'll want to run your own numbers on what the market rents are, what the expenses are, taxes, insurance, things like that. Um, keep in mind, taxes do go up, property taxes every other year. <laughs> 
it's working. Um, so go on the assessor's website and figure out what, you know, what the new assessed value is and how much taxes are going to be next year. Um, as you know, a more in-depth analysis and things like that. So number one, your pro forma is not going to be the broker pro forma. Um, number two related to that is vacancy. You will never see a broker's pro forma with more than 5% vacancy. Um, so for instance, if the property is bringing in $100,000 a year in rental income, the broker will say there will be $5,000 in vacancy. Um, that may be true for physical vacancy, but it doesn't take the whole picture into account. Um, especially markets where rents are rising, you'll have another factor of economic vacancy. Um, meaning a portion of your leases are never going to be at market rate. Um, so, you know, let's say two years ago, something was leased for $800 and now the market rents $1,000. That's $200 of additional loss to lease is the term that um, contributes to vacancy. So a more realistic number, 10% uh, vacancy if the property is stabilized, you know, 15% and up if it's a major value add deal far, far under market. Um, tip number three, uh, I highly recommend using an exit model for your underwriting. Um, this means figure out what the average cap rate, historical cap rate has been in the market. And let's say you want to hold it for five years, which is what we do. Um, figure out what that sales price is going to be in five years based on what your NOI projections are, what that market cap rate is. So you know that you're making money on the back end and not just looking at cash flow. And then um, tip number four, make sure that you have a reserves budget in your underwriting. And this is key. Um, even above and beyond what you have allocated for closing costs, don't forget closing costs, what you have allocated for your renovations, um, have, I would say, at least $10,000 a year. Well, not $10,000. One to $2,000 per unit in additional reserves um, in case something goes wrong. I mean, there might be a boiler that goes out with a 50, can be 50 grand to replace, um, a roof that needs replacing, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, $1,000 a unit in additional reserves would be a great target to have. Thank you so much. In the interest of keeping on schedule, uh, these next few questions we're going to let you just the first person who wants to answer that, that person will answer that question. So uh, this question is, when you put in an LOI, do you do anything creative to make that LOI go through? I <laughs> put our earnest money hard. Okay, so Joe says, uh, puts the makes the earnest money go hard, which Sarah, Sarah said earlier, that's not a hard money loan. That's making it stay, it's always there. It's non-refundable. Uh, it's only contingent on a, a clean title. And it's some environmental issue. And I'd, I'd add, um, include a really solid resume and track record along with your LOI. Um, they want to know that you've done this before and have a good team. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is, what is it like being under contract? So uh, checklists, due diligence, period. Sorry, you went from there so uh, you can't talk with your hands because we can't hear the questions. You can't. Uh, so I have to go. So, um, what is it like being under contract in terms of you, what checklists you have, due diligence periods, lenders, things like that? And um, I will put a shameless plug here. Next Tuesday, we'll have John Rico speaking for Dan all about this. So if you want to come to that, be welcome. Um, but under contract, what is that like for you all? It can be both. You got oh. muted. Turn turned me off. <laughs> <laughs> Can't talk back to that. All right, let's trade. John, the better one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, can, it can be both exciting and frustrating. So it's one of those things you can get that excitement that's going on because you got your deal on your contract and you're working on it, but at the same time, now you're realizing you've got all those moving parts that you have to keep track of. You got your investors, you got the property inspections, the financial inspections of all the records, you're raising money, you're doing all, you're having all these conversations. So again, it can be both exhilarating and it can be extremely frustrating because sometimes you have some sleepless nights thinking about the whole deal and are you, did you make sure you checked every nook and cranny and you didn't miss anything because if you lose money, your investors are going to be pissed and then you're going to never raise any more money again and there's all kinds of different things. So again, it's, it's, both, it's like jumping out of a plane. <laughs> it, it's exhilarating when you jump out 
And it's your you got that fear factor, but as soon as the sheet opens, you're like, ah. Oh. Mike, how do you finance large multifamily properties? A combination. Let's call it let's call it our capital stack. Um, financing is basically from upfront cash that may turn into equity. Um, equity from my equity investors, or the, the people that we are syndicating with. And then, of course, there's the bank financing. And I'm, I'm a fan of Freddie. I love Freddie. Uh, if I could finance every deal through Freddie, I will. Um, because they're great terms. Uh, the, bro- the, 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 the broker that I have dealt with in the past does a great job. Uh, and I think it's a great program for the kinds of deals that I'd like to do. Great. Um, so, what are some of the best sources of equity? How do you find your equity partners? Anywhere I can find them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ultimately, uh, one suggestion is to identify the networks that you're currently a part of, and then based on identifying those networks, then you make a strategic approach about who you speak to within those networks, um, get them on board, and when they're on board, Word of mouth will spread, and that is will be the most efficient way of doing it. You can when when you do that, um, and then you perform on deals. Then you create a network effect and a word of mouth of travel, and then you combine that with some other stuff that you're doing. And that spreads. Sarah and Anthony, um, how many investors do you usually have on one deal, and what is it like working with them? So the biggest deal we've done, we have fifty eight investors. Um, so you're working with a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of communication. I'd say communication is key. Um, the way we do it is, you know, during the entire process while we're under contract, we first announce the deal to our group of investors, usually through an email, then we'll hold an informational webinar. And once people express interest, we'll keep them on our email list and inform them, you know, every week or so how due diligence is going, um, any new findings on the loan. Things like that, um, and then obviously announcing the closing, and we have a monthly newsletter for each property that goes out with a financial summary, uh, project summary, and um, just any information that the investors would need to know, and they can ask questions anytime. So communication is definitely key with <laughs> working with that many people. So the smallest one we did was six investors. The biggest one we did was around 40-ish. So... And- Sarah is exactly correct. You have to communicate. And one of the big things I'll add on it, right? Everybody's happy when you say, how is it like, how is it like dealing with syndicate with uh, investors? As long as the deal's going great, everybody's happy. They're all your best friends. But occasionally you're going to have some hiccups, things that you didn't plan on. And all of a sudden you're going to have to go back to them and give them bad news. I'll tell you right now, it's like a band aid. You need to rip it off and just tell them the bad news. Don't hide it. Don't try and wash it over. I had another partner I was working with, and one of the questions coming up later is, have you ever been a passive investor? I had a deal where I was a passive investor, and the person that was running the deal missed a mortgage payment. And we had no idea. It was only 15000 bucks, And he, but he, because he was the asset manager, he tried to fix it. And then once he fixed it, he was going to tell us about it. It was 15000 bucks. I could have broke out my checkbook if I had known that that was going to happen and wrote a $15,000 check to keep the property from going into default. So to add to what Sarah said, I get, just rip the bandit off. You can have bad news, rip the bandit off, tell them, keep them informed. That's the best thing you can absolutely do every step of the way. Awesome. So when you're looking at these deals, what kind of financial returns are you looking for? And what does that equate to for your investors? There are two things that I look at. One is, will it, will it meet my minimum hurdle to even spend any time on it? Just by doing a, a, a quick analysis, can I see a 20% return on, on cash in this deal as, as just a minimum? Then, depending on the nature of the deal and what kind of risk it, it is involved, am I looking at having to bring in investors who are looking, who should be getting 10% return or a 4% return? And what is the expectation of the kinds of investors that I'm looking at at, at selling the syndication to? Because that's really what we're talking about, is we're selling the deal 
as part of the syndication process. We're selling the security, and that really hasn't been mentioned much in the conversation, is we're selling the security. So there are some rules that we need to adhere to there. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, I'm looking at 20% hurdle out of the chute, and can I bring in my investors and pay them a reasonable return, anywhere from 4 to 10%. How many of you guys have been on the passive side? Uh, Sarah, would you would you tell us a little bit about um, what you think the benefits are about being on that passive side? Sure. So um, it depends on your goals, but passive investing is a great way to get all the benefits of property ownership with almost zero work. Um, you know, there's a typically general partners and limited partners, which is what we've been talking about. And if you have you know no like and trust that sponsorship team and know they're going to do a good job, you as a passive really don't have any additional responsibilities other than just collecting the check in the mail, to be cliche. But, um, yeah, if you have a great team of sponsors, um, being a passive investor still gives you all those benefits of owning a property. Um, you still get the depreciation on your tax returns to offset any gains that the property paid out. Um, you get the benefit of having economies of scale by buying a large multifamily property. Um, for people who've owned smaller properties and had a property manager, there's still work involved with managing the property manager. This is not like that. You really are completely hands off. So, um, great investment, great way to diversify. Um, if you have cold feet about investing in an out of state market, you can invest with sponsors who are local in those states you want to invest in and diversify your portfolio that way. So, um, lots of benefits. Uh, Joe, uh, kind of the same question, but uh, just to clarify for the audience and everybody listening, uh, since we didn't really get into it, what is the difference between passive and the opposite of passive? <laughs> Unpassive. Uh, uh, difference, passive, you uh, look at a deal from a uh, a, a, a sponsor, a deal sponsor, and you say yes or no based on the lens that you look at a deal through. Uh, and then you get a K-1 every at the end of the year. It'll likely show a loss on paper if the depreciation is passed through to you and the rest of the investors, even though you'll, in theory, be getting income on a quarterly, monthly, or annually basis, depending on how it's paid out. And that's basically, and you'll read a monthly report or whatever frequency uh, the the general partner gives you the reports. So if you're on the active syndication the side, uh, what what do you need to do that a passive doesn't need to do? Everything else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything. Uh, money, match up the money, might get the deal, underwrite the deal, find the deal, oversee the, the property, execution, the business plan, come up with the business plan, um, work with the count. Yeah, I mean, ev everything else. That's That's the engineer. <laughs> Um, okay, so what does your typical business plan normally entail for your properties? Um, I think I touched on this a little bit, but uh, usually we buy stabilized properties, so 90% plus occupied um, typically in order to get long term Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac uh, financing. Uh, those have lower interest rates and are backed by the government. Um, they're also non-recourse, which we love on these larger deals. We don't want to have all of our assets on the line um, for putting a you know, multi-million dollar property together. So Fannie and Freddie are what we try to go after, which means we have to go after properties with high occupancy um, in relatively um, good locations, good markets, and light value add. So that's that's what we do. Um you know, our targets typically are, you know, 8 to 10% cash flow and doubling our investors' money in five to six years. And if the property meets that, um, we go after it. I, I have a question as far as, like, there is two ways to invest in these apartments that, that I can see. One is, is to buy something and you add value to it. Another way is to buy it because it's performing really well. Uh, I, for all four of you, um, why do you do your strategy what is your strategy? Why do you do it and not the other strategy? Uh, I do a, I, I, my favorite deal is a light value add where I look at a property and it either needs some renovation, some adjustment to market rents, some improvement in management, uh, 
because you're playing with income and expense to give you the cap rate. It, it's really that simple. But those are the deals I prefer. Say, we look at everything. We look at properties, like I said earlier, completely vacant that need a lot of work done to them. We look at properties that are already performing. It's all about the returns, the ultimate returns that you can get on the, the investment, both through cash flow and appreciation. And I'd say when, uh, when I started out, it was a lot more about cash flow um, and just cash flow. We didn't even necessarily factor appreciation into our analysis at all. It was um, good market, good cash flow. You know, you could run a simple... Excel analysis and know if we're going to make money or not. Um, with these apartment deals, it's a little more complex and um, need to figure out the back end as well. But um, like both both models are great. Great. So we touched on this just a little bit, but I'd really like to get into the practical nitty gritty. So um, could you offer just a little bit of practical advice for someone just starting out? Something that they could do tomorrow or even better as soon as they leave this meeting. What could someone do to to go ahead and further their endeavors here? I mean, instead of passively uh, read, watch, listen, actively speak to people who are doing it within a platform that you create, and then that will scale. I'm proof. It scales. Other people who I work with, they do that. It scales. Uh, and then you're actively involved. And you will not only learn from others, but you also start being perceived to be at that level or a similar level to others who you're interviewing, um, and then eventually you'll uh, you know be in reality you'll be at that level because you'll be doing things along the way. Any other advice out there? Just real, real quick, books, website, whatever you think would be helpful for people here. I, yeah, I think one of the big things is learning about the market. So there's certainly some websites you can go to. One is Brickadia.com. Um, I, you also need to understand the crime that's going on in a particular area. So I would go to crimereports.com, spotcrime.com, and no matter what comes up on either of those sites or even Trulia, no matter what comes up, you have to go talk to the local police department. That's something you can do right now if you're thinking about investing in a certain area. Just walk into the local station that, that controls that area and ask to speak to somebody who's in that area and find out what kind of crimes are happening, the, the severity of the crimes, the frequency of the crimes, that kind of stuff. And just Google it. it just go to Google and say, something like apartment market information or apartment market cycles, and you'll have a whole bunch of websites that come up. I want to put the name of the city that you're interested in investing in. You'll have a whole bunch of websites that come up. You can do a lot of research that way. Um, yeah, not too much to add. Um, you know, know, know the market. Uh, listen to podcasts. Find, go to an event. Joe's having an event tomorrow, I believe. You can sign up for that. Um, assuming there's still clubs. But... Um, yeah, do things like that, and um, the other thing I was just going to mention was know your investor DNA starting out. Know that multifamily is really what you want to be doing, what plays to your strengths and plays to your financial goals. Um, there's a lot of facets in real estate, um, and you know, make sure that multifamily is it, and then commit to it and move forward. We have time for two to three, and I'll let you go, Mike. I, I know it's important. We have time for two to three people to have uh, specific questions. If you're going to do that, go to uh, go over here to Scott real fast. All right, uh, Mike, will you tell us what you're upset? Oh, I, I was just going to add that depending on depending on where you are in your knowledge level on apartments, because we're talking about apartments and syndication is to A, get the fundamentals on the apartment investing first. Whether that's to take a class or, or to read, but get familiar with the terms of terminology and those fundamentals. Uh, and then if, you've, if you decide you have certain market conditions that you want to investigate, my personal way is to walk and talk, and that's to walk properties, talk to property management people on site in a market that you're interested in investing in, and then locate owners and try to talk to owners. There's nothing better than knowing the market, walking the neighborhood during the daytime and at night. Because if you don't feel comfortable walking it at night, maybe that's not the neighborhood for you. <laughs> All right, we've got a question right here. Where, where can you get education about um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae understanding? What those loan programs are all about. 
John Romero, John, where are you? John Romero, <laughs> Peyton John Romero, call me. <laughs> uh, well, one more question? That's all I'm going to do. Um, so my question is, how soon should you involve the uh, uh, property management company who's underwriting? Because you're looking at a deal. Um, do you go to the property managers for every deal to kind of try and understand if you can raise the rents to a certain, you know, number or, or certain amount? Because then you go to them for every deal that you're looking at, and sometimes the first reports, you know, are not maybe enough. It's, it's not to create your assumptions, it's to validate your assumptions when you go to the property management company. And when you are at the point where you're validating your assumptions, you're pretty far down the road where you personally have already done the rent comp analysis based on calling up the rent comps and also looking online uh, for you know, through different resources to see what the rents are, apartments.com or whatever else. And then, I mean, those are just, that's just the reps and revenue assumptions, also the expense assumptions. you You've done your due diligence and you know what it will likely be at. So once you've done your underwriting and you have your assumptions, then you go to them and validate those assumptions. Yeah, and as a simple rule of thumb, I mean, I would say when you're close to getting under LO, pretty sure you're going to be selected for the property. Um, get the get the property manager on board. Let them know the details about the property, and they can make sure that it's still a good decision. Um, and it's not, and you can still get out of the deal pretty easily if needed. So the other thing I would recommend too is you need to do some pre-search beforehand. You know what pre-search is? Before, but you need to find the property manager ahead of time. So you need to know that you're going to invest in a particular market first. Start interviewing property managers. And how do you find them? You ask other apartment owners through the apartment association, wherever you can meet them, who they would recommend to do the property management. And it has to be on the type of property that you're looking to purchase in the first place because not every property manager will manage every single property that comes across their table. They have a specific niche that they're looking for, and that's what they stick with, or a particular area in town. So you need to do that research ahead of time to find a manager before you actually start finding a property. Because now, if you wait until you find a property and then go find a property manager, you're cutting into your time that you have available to raise funds and actually close the deal, which is not good. So. All right, so I just have one last question. Um, we have, to, we have to cut it off, and so you can ask personally, I'm sorry. How, if, and for the camera, how can people get a hold of you guys if, uh, if they want to contact you directly? Uh, sure, so my company is Regency Investment Group. You can find us on the web at regencyinvestmentgroup.com, or my email is sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at regencyinvestmentgroup.com. Um, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, whatever you prefer. Yep. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook. The website is successclasses.com, successclasses.com. Just put Anthony in front of that, Anthony at successclasses.com. You'll get my email. Oh, you're <laughs> We bonded over the last two hours. Uh, for anyone who wants an apartment resources guide, happy to give it to you. Just email info, info at joefrailis.com. It's got a bunch of apartment resources from books to podcasts to uh, research websites that you can check out. So info at jokerless.com. Uh, mine is really easy, and uh, and I won't be bashful. My email is mcrana at gmail.com. Also, if you give me your business card at the end of the session, I will also send you free a copy of all the roles and responsibilities of syndication sponsors. This is everything that you know and love and want to do. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we appreciate you guys' time so much. Thank you for being here. Thanks for planning to be here. Thanks for all the education that you've given everybody. A uh, big round of applause. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. Right. Time to network.